God is absolutely able. Amen. Praise God. I'm so happy to be back here in the house of the Lord one more time. I miss y'all last week. Amen. In fact, when I got up to preach at Wesley Union and the Zion Church, I looked at you up and spoke very highly of you. And I want you to know how much you mean to me. That I wanted Wesley Union to know uh, that, that I had a wonderful family back in Charlotte that I was missing. And amen. That, and that they were grateful uh, for you sharing me last week. But it's nothing like being home and being with your family. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's give a word of thanks, a, a, a clap of thanks to Pastor Leslie. Amen. 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 You got to walk it out, walk it through, and walk it through, was it? Walk, walk that thing. That's right. Amen. Amen. I had a chance to watch it on Facebook. She put it on Facebook Live. And I'm going to make you laugh. So I'm sitting in the Chinese uh, buffet this week. And I know my black Asian uh, guests to sit inside and thought something was wrong. I was hollering and screaming because the word was speaking to me. Amen. It was it was speaking to me. And I know, in fact, one little kid walked by on the plate looked at me like, oh, that man crazy. Mama, get away from him. Uh, but I enjoyed uh, that word. And, you know, I one of the biggest compliments that a preacher can give another preacher is that when they preach, you don't feel the need to go back and cover the same material. Amen. Amen. You got part four of our sermon series last week. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You got it mightily. And so today, we're going to move on to part five. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. If you didn't get the word, go to Pastor Leslie's Facebook page and sit him right there. She did an awesome job. In fact, I told her this morning, uh, amen before the rest of us got here and I don't mind sharing this I believe to give people their roses while they're still alive, amen that it's clear that she is here because of God amen. and it's clear that God chose her to come bless us and she has done nothing but affirm God's love for us affirm God's uh, in, in favor for us and, and amen. We again, we've got someone here that no one can sing and play, but it's right music, y'all. Do y'all do y'all know we're singing songs? There ain't no one else singing in the world. And, and, amen. Praise God. Praise God. And, and, in fact, you know what? When I'm speaking into her life, is that she is able to re reduce this to a CD. Amen. And then that CD blows up, and then I'm sitting there begging her, please, Pastor, let's pick up the phone. We don't have no one to sing. The people don't want me to sing Sunday morning. Please tell me you're going to be back in the country by Sunday. Amen. That's the, amen, amen. And then I, and I believe that is going to happen. Amen. There is a word from the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at the end of the chapter. We're going to look at verses 35 to 43. Amen. Mark chapter 5, verses 35 to 43. Amen. Amen. Uh, I will read from the New Living Translation. Once you have it, please stand to your feet and indicating that you have it. Again, we apologize. Normally we would have it on your boards, but uh, they're not working right. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn us to Mark chapter 5. We're going to pick up with verse 35. The New Living Translation reads as follows. While Jesus was still speaking to the woman he had just healed, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of this synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but Jesus made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, Jesus said to her, to leave the home, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. 
They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated. As we indicated a few minutes ago, this is part five of our sermon series, Fighting Faithfully for Freedom. Fighting Faithfully for Freedom. You know, when I was younger in the faith, amen, not necessarily a young child, but younger in the faith, I had a fear that constantly nagged at me. And this fear would beat me up on Sunday, it would beat me up on Monday, it would beat me up on Tuesday, it would beat me up every day of the week, and especially beat me up whenever I was going through some sort of tribulation, trial, or ordeal. I had this fear that I, that the time would come, I would need God, and then God wouldn't be there. That there would, that, that as good as his promises were to me, I just in my mind could not foresee or understand that the word was true, that the Lord God, the Lord that we serve would never leave us or forsake us, that in my mind there had to be something that would trigger God to leave me right here in this mess, in this ordeal, in this situation, in this predicament, in this trial, and in this tribulation. And I would, I was so afraid, and the reason why I was so afraid because in my life I had experienced that from other people. People had left me. People had abandoned me. People had betrayed me. And here it is, I was worshiping God amongst people. And I thought and I feared that maybe the God I was worshiping was just like the people that I was worshiping with. That the day would come when he would lead me and forsake me, that I would need him to do something. I would need him to bless me. I would need him to help me. I would need him to protect me. I would need him to fight for me. I would need him in some way and he wouldn't be there for me. That was my fear. And here's the thing, when I cracked open the scripture for today, it's, I was told that my fear wasn't unusual. That other people have experienced the same fear and are experiencing the same fear that I used to experience. It's right there in your scripture. Iaris the synagogue leader has a daughter. We don't know how many other children he has, but he has a daughter. A 12-year-old little girl. She currently means the world to him. The world to her daddy. Amen. I'm a daddy and I have some daughters. Kenny has some daughters. All of us that have daughters understand what I say when we say we love our daughters. Them knucklehead boys may get the foot, get the boot. But our daughters get the love. And I know that's not fair. I know that's not always right. But the truth is, daddies and their girls, that's such a special relationship. In fact, the funny thing, I can start to see it now with my son and my wife. Amen. That is how he works. I mean, he, she could be sitting in the room and he'll walk in. He's like, Mommy! She said, she was like, TK. And he'll come and he'll grab her cheeks. They pull her face close to her, him, and he would kiss her, and I would see her grab him up and hug him, and I wanted, I wanted to say just that. What was all that talk about me and these girls? Because you're falling for the same thing. It's that bond that exists between a father and daughter, a mother and son. Jairus loved his girl, and his little girl, his little princess, had become sick. In fact, this sickness was no ordinary sickness. This sickness was a spiritual sickness. Because I'm sure Iaris, being the synagogue leader, being the most important person in the community, had the funds to go to the best doctors in the community. In fact, I would not be surprised if the woman with the issue of blood and Iaris and his daughter were all both sitting in the same waiting room many, many times. He had a chance to go to the best, but the best could not save his daughter. 
In fact, the truth is, we focus so much on what the, couldn't happen with the woman with issue blood that we failed to realize the same thing was happening with E.R.S.'s daughter. And one day it hit him. One day he got up and on his mind was Jesus. Yes, Jesus had been his appointed. Yes, Jesus had been his enemy. But here was Jesus renowned for the ability to do the impossible, to be able to heal those who were sick, to be able to enable those who were paralyzed to walk, to enable the deaf to, uh, to hear, to mute, to speak, and the blind to see. He was able to cure leprosy and other kind of illnesses. And he had done it time and time again. And the iris fall, maybe he will do it for me. And so he hires, gets up, he leaves his place of prominence, his place of influence, his place of power, and he goes to where Jesus is and he submits himself to Jesus. And he asks, or he begs, please, Jesus, to come heal his daughter. In fact, he's certain Jesus could heal his daughter if Jesus would just get there to heal her. And so Jesus says, yes, I'm going to heal. And he started walking to his house. But on the way, going to his house, they encountered the one with the issue of blood. And all of a sudden, the, the progress, the progression stopped. Amen. Because she took his attention. And I, we don't know how long he, the, the attention was for. We don't know uh, the length of duration of the experience. But what we do know is that the progression stopped. The crowd stopped moving. Jesus stopped moving to address her issue. And now you know, come on someone, help me, that when you are pressed, when you're back against the wall, when you think you don't have much time to live, time to survive, every moment, every second, every minute counts. In fact, if anyone who's ever uh, engaged in first aid or EMS, then you're taught to not waste time. You're taught first how to stay calm, how the process is seen, because every second matters in someone's life. Do you know that someone's heart can stop for 30 minutes? and they can start it back up. But if you do not keep air going to the brain, in five minutes a person will be dead, brain dead. That's why they tell you to do the compressions on the heart. Not necessarily because you're trying to start the heart again, but what you're doing, you're compressing the lungs in and out and the body is taking in air so that the brain keeps getting air. Every second counts. You cannot be scared. And so here is Iris. He's looking down at his Apple iWatch or his Samsung uh, 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 cellular watch, and he's counting the time. He's got a timer on it, and it says that he had they had to be at his house by a certain time. But at the moment, his time is being spent on this woman with the issue of blood. And at some point, while Jesus was still talking to the woman. Even after he healed her, he was still talking to the woman. I love how Sister uh, Leslie uh, preached last week how Jesus' inclusion dismissed uh, the, 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 the rules, the Torah, how her, his inclusion of her, it made her part of now a family. And because they're now part of a family, they're interacting with each other. But while they're interacting with each other, here comes service from Yaris' house. And they say, don't trouble the teacher anymore. Your daughter is dead. That, y'all, to hear those words that a loved one is dead is devastating. There is nothing like it in the world. And too many times I have personally been told that someone that means the world to me is no longer here. They're dead. And it freezes you in that moment. It stops you dead in your track. It takes, in fact, it snatches the air out of your lungs. In fact, when you tell most people, the first thing they say is, I cannot breathe. Because that is the worst thing that someone can feel, someone can experience. This is why I was saying it's important for us to pray for the families in El Paso, the families in California, the families in Dayton, Ohio. Because when someone came to their door, when someone called them, when someone, when they turned on the news and they saw that their loved one was dead, everything stopped for them. Everything stopped. They, the Jairus is in pain that his baby girl, the one he loves, the one he cherishes, the one that he would let come sit on his lap, the one he would let reach into his plate and grab a fried chicken wing or a french fry or a piece of candy or share ice cream with, she's not here anymore. And the first thing he probably thought was, 
Had this woman not interrupted Jesus, my daughter would still be alive. And remember that fear I was talking about earlier? I'm sure that fear sets in. That Jesus was too late to make a difference. Jesus was too late to help. That Jesus was, he wasn't punctual. He wasn't on time. I, yeah, the old people say he's right on time, but he wasn't on time here because if he had been on time, he could have saved this young girl from dying. And here it is Yars is wrestling with what I wrestle with. Is there a time or an instant where God fails to show up in a timely manner and as a result, we lose? I don't care how you cut it. I don't care how you slice it. I don't care how you name it. Death is a loss. It's a loss. And it looks like God has lost. And Charles, and not only is he fearful now, I bet he becomes angry. Come on, tell the truth. Shame the devil someone. And here it is. You know you need God in your life. You need God to do something for you. You need God to bless you. And, all, and God says, okay, I'll go with you to bless you. But on your way to bless you, God stops to bless someone else. The, the sad thing about many of us, we think God is a God of finite, finiteness. In other, we, in other we think there's only so much that can be get, gained from God. And if we don't get what we need to get from God first, someone else will take us. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God is a God of unlimited resources. God is a God of unlimited power and unlimited time. And that many times we lose sight of that. And when someone interacts, when someone interrupts or distracts God from getting to us, and because God, they want God to bless them, we get mad at them. And claim that they have stolen our blessings. I know you don't want to admit it, but guess what? That's what you said about the person that got the job that you wanted. That person stole my job, stole my blessing. In fact, let's, let's be for real. Come on, come on, ladies. Ed. I know you love the husband you have, but at some point you were gaming for someone else. And some other woman got your, got your husband. Until you met the husband you got now, you were walking around being mad, talking about that tramp is sleeping with my husband. Come on now, I mean, I'm just, Ken is looking at me like I'm crazy. Amen, amen, amen. But someone, when you drive home today, like, you know, Pastor Alan really talking about me, but I could raise my hand because my husband was sitting right beside me. And I didn't want my husband to think I don't love him as much as I say I do. But come on, tell the truth. There's been something that you wanted, something that you've been asking God for, something that you needed God to do, and God turned around and blessed someone else before he blessed you, and then you got upset. Instead of having the, 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 the ability to realize that God is blessing someone on the way to bless you, God is trying to show you what he can do for you when he gets there. That's some, that sometimes you need to get a taste of the, and a sampling of just how awesome God is before he does it so that when he blesses you, you can give him the praise. So Celestia shouldn't have to pump you up talking about, come on, put your hands together. I should have to pump you up and sell, tell you that you should praise God. You should come in here praising God because God has given you a sample of what he's going to do. And because it's so good. You can't wait for you. I, if I, if I love going to South Park, amen, because there's a little Chinese restaurant there, and the little woman is out there with the two pigs and the tray of food, and amen, amen. And I have my hat on, and so I'll come around my hat straight one time to get a sample. I come back, my hat turn back to get another sample. I come back, my hat turn on this side to get another sample. I come back, my hat turn on this side to get another sample. I even take my hat off and put it under my shirt and come back, and she's so happy to give away samples, and she doesn't realize she's giving eight samples to the same person. And I love it because the food is so good it white makes my mouth water about what I'm about to purchase. That's what God is trying to do with your neighbors. What will happen when we see that we get mad and get upset. And we think that God doesn't have enough for us. That God spent on someone else what was meant for us. And today, as we bring this part of our sermon series to a close, God wants to deal with that, that fear. He wants to help us understand how to process and handle that fear. Amen. Praise God. First thing we have to do, we must never allow our fear to overwhelm our faith. Come on, that's good. I have said it before. God has had me say it before. And he wants me to continue saying it. 
Fear is a lie. It's false evidence appearing real. It's not the truth. And here's the thing. You cannot be faithful and fearful at the same time. I don't know how many physicists we have in here, how many scientists we have in here, but one of the first laws, uh, 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 one of the first laws of physics is that time, that 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 time and space, no, that the same piece of matter cannot occupy the, uh, the, the one period of time and space. Amen. That if I duplicated you and, and I put you right here, I would have to put the duplicate you right here because the two of you could not op occupy the same space. Y'all would collapse in on each other. That's a theory of physics. That's a law of physics. Amen. Well, guess what? Faith and fear cannot occupy the same space. You can't act in faith and be terrified at the same time. And I know what someone is saying. Someone is saying right now, you don't pass out. I don't know why you front. I don't know why you pretending like you don't ever get scared. I don't know why you acting like fear never sits it occurs in your life. And I'm not saying that fear won't occur, but I'm saying you can't exercise faith and be fearful at the same time. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Amen. Praise God. I'm very concerned about that man back there. He has my name. Well, actually, I have his name. Amen. Because he birthed me and, and, and I love him love him the light and there's sometimes when I look down on my phone I see these messages I see older black men and without my glasses they all look like dead and so when I see something happening that like yesterday while I was working on this sermon there was a a, 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 a news report that an older black man in the north part of Charlotte had walked away from his caretakers and they didn't know where he was. And I looked down, I went and grabbed my glasses, I opened it up to make sure it was not my father. That was me being fearful that maybe, just maybe, he got away from mom. I bet, that's fear. Here's another one. Now y'all know what, what perfect driver I am, what, what, what slow, law-abiding driver I am, that you know, when I drive, I'm such a safe driver, and that you don't have to worry about anything on the world, on the road. I don't know why y'all shaking your heads. Amen. Ain't none of y'all ridden with me. Amen. Praise God. I am a safe driver. I'm still alive. Amen. Now you ain't no ain't no injury to me. Amen. So I was driving home this week, and I was coming to the uh, intersection right there at Lebanon and with the McDonald's and the Wells Fargo right there. And I had the green light. And while I'm coming, I look to the right and I see this black Chevrolet Impala coming. And it is burning rubber. I mean, it is flying. And I'm saying to myself, okay, does the driver see something at this intersection that I don't see? You know, it's some, and I double check, my light is green. I can now I can I can start to see their light is red, but it's not slowing down. And I was like, oh Lord, this fool is gonna hit me. It's, and if he hits me going this speed, he's going to hurt me. So what I do, I stomp down on the brakes and the horn. And the horn, and, and whatever he was in, it woke him up because he stepped on the brakes and he skidded to a halt. So I skid to a halt over here, he skid to a halt over there, and, and they got nerve look at me like, what dude? <laughs> what, 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 what? I'm like, well, I can save your life and my life. Now, don't get it twisted. At that point, I didn't, it wasn't like I didn't think God wouldn't protect me. It wasn't like I didn't think God's word was going to be canceled in my life. I know what God has spoken over me. Here's another thing I didn't want. I didn't want a car payment. Because the way he was going, he was going to total that car. And then I was going to have to start making payments again. And so I'm like, God, you, I need you to work this out. In other words, I was exercising faith even in the moment of being fearful that he was going to hurt me. But I was not scared that God's promises would fail. That's what God is saying to you right now. That in ERs, when he, when these servants came to tell him his daughter was dead, he thought that the promise God made now was null and void. God made him a promise when he said, I will go with you to your house and I will heal your daughter. And now that she's dead, he became fearful that the promises that Jesus made had been canceled. And Jesus had to say to, 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 to uh, Iaris, do not be afraid, just have faith. There it is in scripture. Confirmation. We must never allow our fear to overwhelm our faith. 
And let me help you. Because someone said, well, Pastor, that sounds good. How do I do that? Okay, I'm going to show it to you, okay? Imagine that this is a chasm that you have to cross, okay? You don't know what's out there. It's dark. You can't see. This is how you exercise faith. I believe I can. I believe I can. I believe I can. God's word wow. will do it. I believe I can. Remember the story about the little engine that could? That's a story about faith. I know I can. I believe I can. God's got me. Praise God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And you keep taking a step forward. There was a guy that crossed the Niagara Falls on a wire. And if you saw it, you, you heard what he said the whole time he was on the wire. He kept thanking Jesus for every moment of his life. In other words, I know he was afraid. He heard the sound of the roaring water. He could look down to see how far the drop was if he fell off. But he did not stop praising Jesus as he was going through this situation. You got to do the same thing. You got to get in your mind that you're going to praise Jesus whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's safe, whether it's scary. You got to get in your mind that you're going to trust God for everything that he has for you in your life. And it doesn't matter what you're up against. It doesn't matter what the doctors say. It doesn't matter what the lawyers say. It doesn't matter what the banker says. It doesn't matter even matter what, what, what your father says. You are going to trust Jesus through it all and as you trust Jesus Jesus is going to get you where you need to go you cannot allow your fear to overwhelm your faith amen that's the first one the point our second point this morning we must separate ourselves from persons that are either unwilling or incapable of exercising faith with us we must separate ourselves from persons that are either unwilling or incapable of exercising faith with us. Let me show you people in the scripture that are unable to exercise a faith that Jesus needed to have in order to perform the miracle he was going to perform. The first group of people who did not have the faith that Jesus needed them to have was the household servants. Yeah. It's in their stick that you can see it. They said, Master, your daughter is dead. There's no further need to trouble the teacher. Jesus was a rabbi. Don't get it twisted. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. That is a proper identification of Jesus. However, that wasn't all Jesus was. Because at this point, Jesus was a healer. Jesus was a savior. Jesus was a restorer. Jesus was all this in a bag of chips. However, the servants could only see him as a teacher, and they wanted Jairus to see him as a teacher. And they told, they, they were saying that since he's merely a teacher, he cannot deal with this. And we're talking about death now. We're talking about the things of God. And the most he can do is teach you about the word of God, but he cannot deal with the things of God. And so leave him alone. Can I, can I give you a word from the Lord right quick? Be careful of the people you're around because many of the people around you around do not see you the way God sees you. Amen. If they saw you the way God saw you, they would have treat you the way they're treating you right now. If they knew that you were a child of God sitting here on, 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 on assignment to accomplish a fulfilled purpose, they will move out of your way because they will realize that coming against you is coming against God and they would not do it. But the problem is many people think they're better than you, they think they're greater than you, and they want you to be under them and beneath them and below them. And so they treat you like that. They minimize who you are. They reduce who you are so that they can feel bigger than you. Let me tell you, not that I really care. I, I don't, I don't. But it is so disrespectful when I go places and certain colleagues of mine still call me Minister Al. Well. Minister Al was who I was when I first started ministry. Come on. Since then, God has elevated me to new places in ministry. So when you call me Minister Al, what you're saying to the people around us is that you're not recognizing, you're not honoring where God has brought me. I don't care if you call me Pastor Al, Reverend Al, Dr. Al. One of those works. But that recognizes that God has put me on this level. Same thing. I remember when I was a kid and one of uh, uh, one of Dad's friends uh, was coming by the house and to, to, to pick up something from Dad. He was a doctor. And when he came, and I opened the door, I said, hello, Mr. Clement. 
dead pop in the back of my head and said, no, you call him Dr. Clement. He has worked hard for that recognition. He's worked hard for the acknowledgement. You recognize him as who he is. My father would not let me reduce that Mr. Dr. Clement to Mr. Clement because that was a denigration and disrespectful to him. Persons that do not recognize who you are, who minimize who you are, you need to be careful. And if they are minimizing who you are, you need to walk away because they don't respect who God has made you to be. So the teach, the, the, the servants come to Jesus, come to the and they say, don't bother the teacher anymore. Don't bother the one that's going to teach you how to read the scrolls. Don't bother the one that's going to teach you what Isaiah meant when he said this or he said that. Don't bother him. They don't see Jesus as a healer. And they don't think Jesus can, can deal with the situation uh, as it is. They, they too think Jesus is out of time. Time. Here's another group that, that, uh, that you got to watch out for. Jesus takes the hours and, uh, and goes to the hours house. He gets there. He hasn't gotten inside yet. And he hears all the wailing, the weeping, and the commotion. He's outside. How loud you have to be. I can remember one time me and the kids were having a ball in the house. And you know, Cole was nowhere to be found. Amen. We were just having a ball. I don't think no one took a bath. I don't think our hair, the head was done. Nothing. We had the TVs up loud. We were eating every place where we weren't supposed to eat. And we were having everything we weren't supposed to eat. And she pulled up on us, pulled a quick one on us, came home early on us. And she pulled up, and the first thing she said, do you know I can hear y'all all the way down from the street? Do you know how loud we had to be? The three of us in the dog, that she could hear us out on the street? That's how loud they were, that Jesus walks up to the house, and he gets to the house, and he hear all the commotion happening inside the house, and he goes inside the house, and what he sees is that the Iris' house is full of mourners. Now here's the thing during this time. These aren't family members that have come to mourn. These aren't neighbors that have come to mourn. These aren't people that have a legitimate right to mourn. These are what we call professional mourners. They traveled around mourning with people who lost something. All right, they came, they cried with you, they weep with you, they fell out on the floor with you, they snot bubbled with you, they did all that you do, and then they got paid for mourning, and then once they thought they had mourned enough, they got up and left. Here's another word from the be careful of the people around you that can only see negativity. If we have lived our lives according to God's will, God's plan, and when he calls us home, that's not a time to mourn. That's a time to celebrate. I keep telling y'all, when Pastor Al checks out of here, I want Earth, Wind, and Fire, I want Rick James, and I want uh, 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 a, a, a cooling again. Now, I don't know how much y'all would do about Rick James because he ain't here no more. But y'all y'all get a Rick James substitute. I want there to be a part. I, I, want, I, 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 want, I want y'all to be playing Marvin Gaye, uh, uh, got to get up. I want, I want, I want y'all to be, I want y'all to play playing, who there it is, who there it is. I want there to be a part because guess what? When I go home, God has said I have done everything that he called me to do and that he's given me my reward. I don't want you here warning me. I don't want you here shedding the tears or something that when you get a ring, really are hurt and you stub your toe or you, or, or you bust your knee. Say no tears and don't cry for me and celebrate my life. Those mourners were not persons coming to celebrate life, but to exacerbate the loss. And persons that want to exacerbate the loss, losses that you are experiencing, you need to be careful for because that means they don't want you to succeed. They don't want you to get ahead. They want you to stay right where you are in the pain and the suffering. This is why you never see your congratulators when you do something good, but when you do something bad, your haters are all the same, aren't they? I mean, you barely, your, your backside barely hit the ground before they're like, I knew that was going to happen. I told everybody you were going to be a success. That's because people want to see you fail. You do understand right now that there are churches that want to see this church fail. Come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. I can, I can spout about five of them right now. 
that want to see this church fail because they want to be able to say that they knew more about this church than God did. And God said, you got to be careful of those people. Some of the people we got around, they're not around you because they're your friends, because they want the best. They're around you so they can have front row seats when you fall. And here it is. We're too scared to walk by ourselves. We're allowing them to continue to have front row seats in our lives. I need someone here to man up. I need someone here to woman up. And I need you to have to, to conduct, conduct an assessment on the people that you have around. And if people are not helping you grow, not helping you get better, not helping you flourish, they are not for you. And guess what that means? Some of the people that we call, say we love, got to go. And that's the hard part. Because we say we love them. But they're not doing it to bless us, to help us. Amen. So he gets in the house. And so Mark chapter 5 tells us that he, he separates the non-believers and makes it and the haters from Eiris, his wife, and the disciples he chose twice. The first time was when he left the household servants back with the crowd. Remember Jesus, everywhere Jesus go, there's a crowd that's following him. And when the, when the woman Ishmael came up and touched her, she touched him through a crowd. She came through a crowd. And so this crowd is a, has a mass and it's following Jesus. I mean, he can't go anywhere. But at this moment, remember it said that God needs someone who can operate in faith to go with him, to believe with him. And so all these people who could not believe, who only were looking for Jesus for something that they did that blessed them and not the body, he leaves them all behind and goes to Yaris' house. And he gets to Yaris' house and see what's going on. And he puts everyone out. In fact, this should be a common thing for Jesus because he goes to his house, his temple, and he puts out those who are, who are the money changers and the animal uh, sellers, merchants, because they are selling defective animals, animals that do not meet tor the requirements of tour and the money changers, the weights are funny. They're, 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 they're using weighted weights so that they are cheating people out their money. Jesus is known to put people out of houses when they are out of order in the house. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? You need to put some people out of your house. You need to put them out. In fact, you need to learn how to separate them. Because where you're going, God needs you to implement faith. And let me say this, and I'll move on to my next point. Let me say this right quick. The amount of faith needed is in direct correlation with the task God assigns to you. The insignificant, the more insignificant the task, the less amount of faith you need. The greater the task, the greater amount of faith you need. Let me give it. In fact, my sister, Pastor Leslie, was uh, uh, saying this. I had walked out because I couldn't find my iPad. And I realized I didn't need my iPad because the sermon wasn't on my iPad. So, but I heard her walking out and she was talking about faith and how we are trusting things. And I was getting ready to turn back and say, get out my sermon! But that just means we're on the same page spiritually. Amen. Amen. Each one of us came in here this morning and guess what we did? Amen. Let me take one. Okay, I'll just sit here, all right? I can't take this. Amen. Y'all start laughing at me. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Everyone came and you did this. At no time did you check up under the seat to see if the seat had a weight requirement. You did not check under the seat to see when the seat was made. Because every element has what we call half-life. That's the amount of time that the element can actually exist. You didn't check to see what the half-life was. You didn't ask who was sitting here before. You didn't ask anyone at church. Have you sent your chairs a chair repair? Have you made sure that the screws in there? In fact, what we did, we all came, we didn't even think about it, and we did this. We exercised enough trust and faith in these chairs to sit down, and we trusted that they would hold us up. Amen. But that, now that didn't require a lot of faith, but here it is. We want to affect the neighborhood out here. We want to bring God to the neighborhood. We want to change the character and the flavor of the neighborhood. Well, guess what? Having the faith to sit out in this chair is not as adequate for doing that and changing the neighborhood. Changing the neighborhood requires greater faith because guess what? The neighborhood is not going to welcome us at first. The neighborhood is going to look at us suspiciously. They're going to look at us as if we're coming trying to pimp them and take something from them. And they're going to put us through hell before they open up and actually trust us. And if you don't have the faith to endure, if you don't have the faith to understand that they are that they are cautious, they 
they are concerned and they do not want to get burned, then you are not prepared to change this neighborhood. Stay yourself inside these four walls. God has called us to do some great things, but in order to do them, we have to have great faith. And part of having great faith is aligning yourself up with persons that also have great faith. And guess what? It ain't all about what they say. It ain't all about their ability to sing or their ability to declare a word. It's the fact that persons keep getting up every morning and keep moving forward. That's a person of great faith. Because you don't know what they're going through. You don't know the hardships they're dealing with. You don't know the troubles they're going through. But they still get up every morning. And they keep moving. So, so Nancy, I knew you were moving because your name stayed on Brother Sean's lips. I knew. And plus, you know, we have been in Bible study. Amen. You had asked me if I was picking up what you put down. I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down right now. Amen. You made sure, she made sure that I understood who she was and what she was about. And she kept moving. And more than as much as I heard him mention her name, I knew it. And she she was keep moving. It may not have been a great day. It may not have been a great week. She may have had some challenges, but for the fact that her brother-in-law was still mentioning her name, she kept getting up. I need someone in here to celebrate God because you too have gone through some things. This week may not have been a good week for you. This week may not have been on point. In fact, you may have dealt with more trouble than you care to deal with this week, but you still got up. You still moved forward. You still pressed ahead. You still sought God for what God has for you and you still believe enough to turn around and pray to him that he'll need it. That's great faith and if you've got someone in your life that is still getting up, who's still moving ahead, who's still pressing forward then you got a winner in your life and you need to be celebrating with them you need to be supporting them you need to walk up to them and say hey let me put my arm around you and pray with you because I know you are fighting, I know you are pressing I know you are working hard for the glory of God that has yet to revealed in your life and I'm standing with you. That's how you move forward in faith. You move forward in faith together. The Proverbs says uh, uh, two, two in life is better than one for when one falls there's another one to pick them up. And the same Proverbs says a rope made with three uh, three threads is stronger than a rope with one single thread. For the three threads support one another. The whole idea is that in faith, in serving God, we are more productive, we are more faithful, we're more successful when we go together. That's why the enemy doesn't want us to get along with each other. I mean, if you really want to call a spade a spade, that's why the enemy is provoking your president and these white supremacists. Because the more terror they impose, the more they make us scared. The more they make us scared, they make us say, I'm not leaving my house. And if I don't leave my house, I don't walk with you. That means you walk by yourself. That means you're an easier prey to get to. But it's hard to get to you when it's a crowd. I say it all the time. I, 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 I'm, I'm foolish enough to say, I wish these white supremacists would roll over me the wrong way. Amen. I ain't been saved that long. Amen. I just, I just ain't been saved that long. I just wish, in fact, like I see the videos of these little racist old white men uh, harassing these little black kids that work at Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, calling them the N-word, and all they trying to do is get their uh, coffee and donuts together. And I said, I wish I would have been in that Dunkin' Donuts and, 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 and Starbucks when that jumped off. Y'all have to come get your pastor out of jail. I promise you, you have to come get me out of jail. Because first of all, I'm looking at that little kid and that could be my own child. And you sure don't think talking to my own child. And I would hope and think that another brother who thinks like me, who would see that if that was my child, would stand up and protect my child in, in my absence. So guess what? I'm, I'm a fool. I, 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 I haven't got to the point where I don't need fire with fire. I still need fire with fire, y'all. And, and I just wish. But here's, here, but here's, here, here's, here's the wonderful thing. Here's the wonderful thing. God said we don't have to be fire with fire. All we got to do is walk in faith. And he will do it all. He will meet it all. He will take care of it all. Amen. Amen. Let me get my last point. Amen. So then we can go have. Amen. I just introduced y'all to chocolate covered fried chicken wings. Amen. I ain't told y'all about the yogurt covered ribeye yet. I mean, amen. You ain't had nothing till you have the yogurt covered ribeye. 
Amen. It is so good, so delicious. Amen. So our first point uh, here this morning, amen. We must never allow our fear to overwhelm our faith. Amen. Our second point, we must separate ourselves from persons that are either unwilling or incapable of exercising faith with us. And our last point, we must remember that the Lord, our God, is never subject to time limitations or restrictions of any sort. Amen. So Jesus has put the people out of Yairus' Yair house. He's called Yairus and his wife and his disciples, and they go upstairs. Amen. They go upstairs. The, da the daughter is upstairs. She's not down. She's up. She's waiting on Jesus upstairs. I wish I had time to talk about that symbolism within the Bible, that whenever you see something down, it's bad. It's, 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 it's not a good thing, but the word says they go upstairs, which means she's already in a place of blessing. She's already in a place of anointing and favor because she's upstairs. Now, you're going to get that when, you, when you're going to work tomorrow, amen, as you're driving down the road, and then you're driving down the hill, and then when you see the correlation between going down and the things you're experiencing, then you're going to be looking to see when God's going to take you up. So, but they go upstairs, and they say, and then worse that Jesus takes the little girl by the hand, and Jesus, he says, to leave your comb. In other words, that means little girl, I say to you, rise. I know the New Living Translation uh, says, get up. But the word literally means rise, to rise up. That's a, that's a command that says, get up with power, get up with authority, get up with favor, get up with anointing, rise, to leave the account, get up. And she immediately jumps up and starts walking around. Now, here's the thing, remember, the iris is of the thought that Jesus can help his daughter as long as he's alive. Remember his request, his request Come to her, come to my house, lay hands on her so that she may live. It's a double play here because living doesn't simply mean staying alive. Living means operating in the fullness and the will of God. And so here it is, he's thinking that Jesus needs to get there before she dies because if she dies before he gets there, then he can't do anything. But Jesus is the kind that is not subject to time. In fact, many of us, those of us who are of our older persuasion, you're not as young as you were anymore. In fact, you've got a few grades that are speckling and coloring your black and whatnot, and you are sitting here. You know what I'm talking about, that sometimes when Jesus shows up, it may be later than you thought, but when he shows up, he's still able to do what he wanted him to do within the time period. Come on, the old people used to say, he may not come when you want to come, but when he does come, uh, he's right on time. And so here it is for, for Jairus' daughter. Whenever Jesus got there, it was the right time for him to be there because it was Jesus that raised her from the dead. I wish I had someone to understand this. Jesus is the author of life and death. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything that was created was created through the Word. There was nothing that was created that was not created through the Word. Amen. The Word is Jesus. That Jesus is the source of life that God worked through to make us. But then the book of Revelation turns around and says the day is coming when the Lamb will come and he'll crack open the seven seals and he will judge those who have been faithful. And the 144 that have been faithful will be given white robes and be given crowns and they will be called kings in the kingdom of God. God, that Jesus, that, that day of judgment is a day of death. For those of us who believe in God, who serve God, we got nothing to worry about. Amen. That's Pastor Al and a few other of us here. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'll let you figure out who the other ten are. Amen. Amen. But this is going to be interesting. We're going to make a TV show out of this. Who are the ten that are going to heaven with Pastor Al? Amen. Praise God. Amen. But seriously, uh, uh, but those who didn't serve God, those who didn't love God, the day of judgment is death. And the word says Jesus is the judge of death. He's the one that will determine who's going to die. That means he's an author of life and death. That also means that death serves at Jesus' beck and call. See, many of us got upset because a loved one 
is not here, I know. I feel that way about my aunt and my grandmother. But I have to remember that they weren't supposed to be here forever. They were only supposed to be here for a short time. That after that time was up, the hope and prayer was that God would come get them, that he would punch their golden ticket, that he would give them a seat on that special uh, on that special ride, and he would take them back to heaven. I'm actually convinced that he did that, that my, my, my grandmother and my aunt, that they love God, they serve God, they may not have gotten everything right all the time, but their hearts are in the right place. And I believe that they are there with God right now. I believe that, that our loved ones are there too. They didn't do everything right. They didn't, they didn't cross every T and dot every I. But they love God the best they could and they served Him the best they could. And I believe that God has a special place for them. But here's the thing. For them to get there, death has to do something. Death has to shake off this thing we call flesh because you can't get into heaven with this on. The word says that we'll take off corruptible flesh and put on incorruptible the spirit, the spirit of God. And we'll look like Jesus, we'll look like sons and daughters of God, and we will spend eternity with him. Death for the believer is merely a doorway. It's not the final say so. And what we have to do, we have to stop thinking that when death comes, death comes to rob us of something that belongs to us. Our lives don't belong to us, they belong to God. And we also have to stop thinking that God is such a limitations, that God is such a restrictions. My fear that God will not show up on time is because I fear that there was a time limit, a time period that God had to show up and do something. I didn't realize that as the author of time, he stands outside of time. And because he stands outside of time, time doesn't mean the same thing to him that it means to us. The word says a day is a thousand years is but a day, and a day is but a thousand years of God. That here it is. He may be way according to your watch, but he's right on time according to his. And I thank God that God has done that. Now here's a funny thing, and I'm getting ready to take my seat because I'm done with this. I've been preaching the whole time, and the whole time I've been preaching, I've been looking at you, and you've been looking back at me, and I can see what's on your mind. You've been thinking I'm preaching about Iaris. You've been thinking I'm preaching about his little girl. But the truth is, I've been preaching about all of us in here because all of us in here were sick unto death. You may not have an illness, you may not have a sickness, but you were sick unto death because all of us in here were tainted by sin. Sin got each and every one of us. It doesn't matter if you made a great big sin or you made a little small sin. The fact is that you sinned. And because you sinned, you were dying too. And if it had not been for grandma's prayer, if it had not been for grandma's Dad's prayer, and the head out there for mama's prayer or daddy's prayer that God come by and check on my daughter, check on my son, check on my grandson, check on my granddaughter, check on my niece, check on my nephew. Then many of us will be dead lying in our grave on the way to hell with gasoline draws on. That God came and saved us, that God came and renewed us, that God came and cleansed us, that God came and purged us, that God came and tripped us. That God change our look, God change our speech, God change our walk, so that when we show up, we don't look like what we've been through, we don't smell like we what we've been in, and we don't sound like what we're going through. This is why you look as good as you do. It ain't because you went to such and such salon. It ain't because you wear such and such clothes. It ain't even because you took such and such bath. It's because God has cleaned you up and given you a, 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 a beautiful smell a beautiful look, a beautiful purpose, and now you're walking in beautiful. Y'all do know God of God's name is beautiful, right? You're walking in that which he is, beautiful. And because God has blessed you, you now know that there's no such thing as a time limit on God. You know there's no such thing as a restriction on God. In fact, now you can sit back and look at the scripture when the, when the man says, I believe, help me believe, help my son if you can, where you can be indignant with the man because you know that there's no restrictions on God. But you need to celebrate God and praise him for teaching you and getting you to that place where you can declare that. <laughs> Sit up here acting like you've always been saved all your life. Knowing that many of us were in some mess, that, it, that God had to literally come down in the middle of the mess. Someone was getting ready to take another hit of that pipe. Come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. Someone was pouring another glass of that death. 
Someone was getting ready to lay down and sleep with that person when Jesus said, no, 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 I'm your mind, you gotta come. And because of that, he showed you there is no limits. There's no place he won't go to get you. Amen. If we're gonna fight for freedom uh, for others, then we first have to believe that our God can do anything but fail. And you do everything. There's nothing that's too impossible to want for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me do this. Amen. I'm scanning then. 